Welcome to Forest Hills Church Online. We are so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Whether you were at home, on the road, or on a cruise ship, we are just glad that you are here. Um, at Forest Hills, we love God and others. We seek to grow in our faith, and we serve through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Um, our memory verse this week uh, comes from Luke chapter 4, verse 21. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. I should probably mention, you already figured out, I'm not Pastor Andrew. My name is Amanda Lucas, and I am leading this week. So we are going to go ahead and jump right in to our, our songs for this week. Hope has a name, and it is well with my soul.
Isaiah 61 is a servant song that describes the person and work of the coming Messiah. It harkens back to the book of Leviticus as it describes a new and eternal year of jubilee when oppression ends and restoration begins. The Lord God's spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release for captives and liberation for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide Zion's mourners, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in a place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. They will be called oaks of righteousness, planted by the Lord to glorify himself. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will restore formerly deserted places, and they will renew ruined cities, places deserted in generations past. Foreigners will stay and shepherd your sheep, and strangers will be your farmers and vine dressers. You will be called the priests of the Lord, ministers of our God, they will say about you. You will feed on the wealth of nations and fatten yourself on their riches. Instead of shame, their portion will be double. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice over their share. They will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and dishonesty. I will faithfully give them their wage and make with them an enduring covenant. Their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people blessed by the Lord. I surely rejoice in the Lord. My heart is joyful because of my God, because he has clothed me with clothes of victory, wrapped me in a robe of righteousness like a bridegroom in a priestly crown and like a bride adorned in jewelry. As the earth puts out its growth and as a garden grows its seeds, so the Lord God will grow righteousness and praise before all the nations. Isaiah 61, the word of the Lord. Well, this week we're talking about Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness. Uh, and so I thought for our prayer time, it would make sense for us to address the temptations we struggle with in our own life. Of course, when temptation comes, sometimes we are victorious, sometimes we fail. Uh, so spoiler alert, Jesus was able to resist the temptations he faced. Um, and so I just wanted to come to God today in a, a spirit of repentance and confession as we think about those ways that we have failed, that we've caved into temptation, uh, and again, seek the strength of God's Spirit in our lives. So would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that you are a uh, forgiving God. But Lord, the truth is we are, uh, we are weak at times. We fail at times. There are many ways that we're tempted and Satan shows his face or even just the situations in our lives where we uh, do the wrong thing. We do what we should not do. Or sometimes, Lord, we don't do what we should do. So Lord, we come before you with our failings. We come before you with our sins. We just confess them to you now. And Father, as we come to you with our failings, we are so grateful that you forgive. We are so grateful that we can find another chance. We're so thankful for Jesus who, who never sinned. Jesus who came to be our perfect sacrifice, that we could find forgiveness in you. And so Lord, we ask for more of you. We ask for more of your spirit. Lord, we ask for the, the tools, the spiritual tools that we need to fight against these temptations that plague us. Help us, Lord, to uh, find victory in your name and in your presence and by the power of your Spirit. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Hello, Pastor Andrew here. Welcome to today's Generational Bridge. And throughout this sermon series, we've been talking about Jesus as the Son of Man and what that means for Him. But we've also been talking to members of our congregation to hear their stories of what it's like to be a son or daughter of man. And today we get to hear from Matt Lindholm as he recounts some stories from his own father. Hi, my name is Matt Lindholm, and uh, my dad is Bruce Lindholm Jr. So one trait my dad and I share together is our sense of humor. And we both like to see the lighter, see the lighter side of things. Um, it helps break tension in um, situ situations that are serious. Um, one example um, that my dad broke a very tense situation is when my daughter, um, she's my second child when she was born, um, you know, being a, a father again for the second time, still very nerve wracking. And oh, this other, this other mouth I have to feed. Um, the first thing my dad says to his newborn granddaughter is, she's got her hairline. So um, she had that hairline of a uh, middle-aged man, I guess, when she was born, and it put a smile on my face and just kind of put me at ease. Then a life lesson my dad has taught me is commitment um, to always um, have follow-through on commitments, uh, be it church, sports, uh, friends, family, that um, it's, good, it's always good to have follow-through and um, stand by your word. Well, certainly Jesus was a son of man. He was completely human. But he was also the Son of God. Luke is very clear to share that with us in his gospel. As the Son of God, he was completely divine. And we're going to see as Jesus is tempted in the wilderness this, this week, um, how he was able to depend on the strength of his heavenly Father. He was able to rely on the strength of the Spirit within him. And he was able to overcome those temptations that we struggle with as humans. And we're also going to see how Jesus, as the Son of God, was determined to see through the mission that he was given. Just like Matt talked about how his dad taught him to stay committed and to follow through on the things that, uh, the responsibilities and commitments he's made. We see this with Jesus this week as well, as he is determined to be the Savior that God has called him to be. He's determined to see through God's plan to save humanity. And so we are so thankful and grateful that Jesus was such a faithful son of God. Well, welcome back to the Gospel of Luke. We have uh, committed as a church to reading through the entirety of Luke's Gospel in this coming year. And today we are in chapter 4. It's a very pivotal passage and it cements the answer to two very important questions. The first is, how will Jesus go about accomplishing his mission? And the second question is, uh, sort of a review, the question is, who is he again? Who is he for sure? So, so far we've seen Luke drive home the message that Jesus is the Son of God. We saw it in the Christmas story. We saw it in, last week at his baptism. Luke wants us to know that Jesus is not just another human, that Jesus is God, that He is divine, that He is God in flesh. And so today we look at both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus as they are highlighted in this week's passage, which is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And so we read Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterwards Jesus was starving. So we want to note here first how Luke lingers on the Holy Spirit. Jesus is filled with and directed by the Holy Spirit. And where does this lead him? It leads him into the wilderness. It leads him face to face with Satan. The, the Spirit leads Jesus into battle with the devil. And of course, that brings up the question, where do you think the Spirit leads you and I? Into battle. That's, that's, our, that's our, the place where our faith takes us. Jesus is in the wilderness for 
40 days. If you're reading along in your Bible, please take a pen, circle 40 days, and in your, your uh, uh, margin, write the word Israel. Okay, because we know from the Old Testament that God's people wandered in the desert for 40 years. And in that time, their faith was tested. So now Jesus takes on the role not only as God's Son, which we saw at His baptism, the voice from heaven claiming Jesus as the Son of God, but now Jesus is also, uh, in addition to that, a representative of God's people as he enters the wilderness. So he performs, this is before he performs any miracle, before he teaches any sermon, he too will be tested. And so he ate nothing, as the uh, good Dr. Luke points out. The symptoms of that is that Jesus was starving. An obvious detail, but a crucial detail because it's pointing out in highlighted words that Jesus was human. He had a stomach that growled, a body that needed food, he had waning energy levels, Right, he got headaches and injuries and stubbed toes and hammered thumbs. He was human. Now for me, I know if I skip lunch, if I I get hangry and irritable, and I would certainly be in no position to face off with Satan and, and, and win. But Satan seems to find us in our weakness doesn't he? And he speaks directly to Jesus in verse 3, directly to Jesus' humanity. The devil said to him, since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Now most translations use the word if here, if you are the son of God, eat, Satan says, eat. If you are God's son, you should relieve your own suffering, right? And if we think about it, it's an absurd question. To think that God's Son is hungry? To to think that God is in need or is suffering in any way is absurd. And that's Satan's point. Eat, Jesus, if you are God's Son. Jesus replies with the words of Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. He says, people won't live only by bread. And so Jesus is determined to rely upon His heavenly Father alone. He knows that God will provide. Jesus could easily turn the bread, uh, turn the stone into bread, and we see him do that. Uh, well, we see him miraculously make bread for 5,000 people later on in the gospel. But Jesus is here in the wilderness to die to himself. In fact, the Israelites had a name for the wilderness. They called it Jeshimon, and that is a word that means devastation. Devastation. So I, I think of the wilderness as a place God uses to kill the flesh, to kill our fleshly desires. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory, important word for God, the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. And so Satan challenges Jesus' status here, and he says, Rule! Rule. You were supposedly born the king of kings, right? Well, what kind of king has no kingdom? Look what I can offer you. And so if you can imagine Jesus, who, who has known the throne of heaven, Jesus, who has experienced unending glory from unending choirs of angels, tempted by this this shred of glory. Wouldn't it be nice just to have a little bit of honor, a little bit of glory from someone, from anyone? But again, Jesus recites Deuteronomy. He says, it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. So Jesus stands strong again. He will not grab for honor and power, but he is determined to honor only his heavenly Father. And so Satan has one more scheme up his sleeve. It says, The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. And then Satan ups his game with a little scripture passage of his own. He quotes Psalm 91. 
which says, it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. And so Satan is now calling God's character into question. But he's saying to Jesus, uh, if you trust your Heavenly Father so much, then jump! Surely God will protect you. And Jesus goes once again to Deuteronomy. It's been said, don't test the Lord your God. So Jesus is stating here unequivocally that God can be trusted without some sensational event. God is trustworthy. God is honorable. Well, verse 13 says, After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. So Luke does not give us a clean-cut ending to the scene here. He's letting us know that Satan still has a role to play in this story. But Jesus, as, as Israel here, remember, Jesus has overcome, and He's been victorious where the Israelites had failed and were unfaithful. And so we also get the answer to our first question, which was, how will Jesus go about completing His mission? And after this account, we, as, as readers, we are now fully confident in the method that Jesus has chosen. We see clearly He's not picked a path of self-aggrandizement or glory or ease, but in fact, Jesus has chosen the way of humility, the way of suffering, the way of total dependence on God, and ultimately the way of death. We know that the cross is what is in store for this king. And so, uh, for now, for now, Jesus can get some food and begin his ministry. And so we turn to verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So note, again, Luke's wonderful obsession with the Holy Spirit. He returns to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. And so Jesus is gaining some notoriety here. Uh, it says, Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised, and on the Sabbath he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. And so Jesus is back home in a small town, kind of a place where everybody knows everybody, and he stands to read, which was completely normal, as all men were able to do so. Uh, usually they'd read the scripture, and then they would offer some sort of insight or or some probing questions about the passage. And we don't know for sure, but Jesus maybe had been invited as sort of a guest rabbi um, at this point, as he had some notoriety. But we do know that the, the synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay, this would, this would conjure up images of the year of Jubilee, which we read about in the Old Testament. It was a year of restoration, a year when land was returned to its original owners, when slaves were free. It was a celebration. Then Jesus rolls up the scroll, he gave it back to the synagogue attendant, and he sat down. Okay, all this is totally normal. Um, rabbis would read the sacred words while standing, and then they would sit when they were teaching. It says, every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus, so impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. So we need to note here that the Jewish people have a long history of prophets who spoke God's word, but it has now been hundreds of years since God had spoken. And so John the Baptist, he came on the scene as sort of a representative of the voice of the Lord, but he was now in prison, and people were not quite sure what to make of him and how Jesus reads this. Now Jesus comes and reads this crucial passage from Isaiah. It's a passage that describes the person and work of the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. This is a very important passage for the Jews. It's a passage of hope, 
a passage of victory. And here, Jesus proclaims it as God's word for today. Now. In this moment. And so it's exciting. It's life-changing. It's the fulfillment of hope. But wait a minute. You kind of hear the, the record screech here at the end of verse 22. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? Wait a minute. In other words, there's no way the exalted Messiah could possibly be a, a lowly carpenter. There's no honor in that. And we have to be understand that this is a, an honor-based society. It was important to uh, maintain your honor. And actually, when Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness, Jesus doesn't retort to Satan his own words. Jesus responds with the words of his Father, and thereby he's giving honor to his Father in those times. So Jesus knows all about honor. And Jesus says to them, Undoubtedly, you will quote this saying to me, Doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you do in Capernaum. So Jesus had been active in Capernaum already. Word about him spread about what he had done. And so if you look in Matthew and Mark, they put this event at a later time in Jesus' ministry. Jesus is back in his hometown later on. It's in Matthew 13, 54, and Mark 6, if you want to write that down. But in your Bibles, on, in the margin, you can write out of order. Luke is putting this story earlier because his priority is to cement Jesus' identity. Now, Luke is not so much interested in keeping accurate chronology at this moment. He wants us to know for sure, for certain, once again, who this Jesus is. And so Jesus sort of puts words in the mouth of the crowd by quoting this proverb uh, about a physician, which again probably hits Luke a little differently than it does us. He says, doctor, heal yourself. And so in other words, prove yourself. Do the things that we have heard about. And this is really another temptation that Jesus has to fight against. It's a temptation he will fight against over and over every day in his earthly life. And he, he could just snap his fingers and prove his divinity, but he doesn't. He actually goes on to make things worse. He says, I assure you that no prophet is welcome in the prophet's hometown. Okay, or rather, no prophet is honored in his hometown. And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time when it didn't rain for three and a half years and there was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow in the city of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there also were many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman, the Syrian, was cleansed. And when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger. They rose up and ran him out of town. They led him to the crest of the hill on which their town had been built so they could throw him off the cliff. So that takes a dramatic turn here. People were impressed with Jesus. They'd heard good things about him. And here he was before them, proclaiming that Today, he himself was the Messiah, chosen by God to save his people. There's a major problem with Jesus. Jesus had the wrong definition of who God's people are. Jesus has highlighted two stories from the Old Testament, one about Elijah and one about Elisha. These are two powerhouse prophets, two heroes uh, to the Jews. And yet, these are two problem passages because in them, God's blessing is poured out upon Gentiles. It's the Sidonian widow and Naaman the Syrian who are both personally helped by the prophets. And yet, these people do not belong to God's people. And so these stories did not make a great amount of sense to the Jewish mindset. They were stories that the people would have liked to discount and kind of forget about. But here's Jesus identifying as the Messiah, and then bringing up these troublesome accounts of God's relating to Gentiles, and it was just too much. It was just blasphemy. And so the congregation became so frenzied that they decided not to run Jesus out of town, but to kill him and just be done with it. 
However, if they could have remained calm, these Jews would have seen that their complaint is not so much with Jesus as it is with their own scriptures. Jesus is only recounting what the Bible says. And Luke uses this story again to prove the crux of his whole gospel, that God's salvation is for all, Jew and Gentile alike. God extends the hand of fellowship across all racial lines to the lowly Sidonian and to the Syrian soldier. And he has done so all the way back to the time of Abraham when God promises that Abraham will be a blessing to all the nations, to all the world. Well, finally, we get to verse 30. It says, Jesus passed through the crowd and went on his way. So I honestly have no idea how this works. Um, for some reason, I have a picture of this sort of crowd in a dust cloud of, of you know, uh, excitement and frenzy while Jesus just kind of walks away, whistling with his hands behind his back while the commotion is going on. But I suspect Luke is mentioning this. Uh, I think Luke wants us to understand this as a miracle. This was the only miracle then that Jesus performed in his hometown. For Luke, uh, the only miracle Jesus performed was escaping his hometown. Now the next section Jesus goes to Capernaum. This is kind of where we see more of the typical sort of ministry that we associate with Jesus. In fact, our, we're going to kick it off next week with the exorcism of a demon. So we don't want to miss that. But for now, as Jesus escapes his hometown, uh, we sit in gratitude that our Jesus was able to overcome, that he's able to defeat every temptation, that he chose from the outset the way of the cross. God's kingdom came into this world via a manger in Bethlehem. It was solidified in the wilderness called devastation. And God's kingdom was personified by one man in a little Nazarene synagogue. So we see that God went through all this trouble, all this suffering, all this humiliation. There's more to come, of course. But he did it for my sake and for your sake whether Jew or Gentile. He came to initiate relationship with humanity. And so we praise God. Now, for us as Jesus' followers, we desire to be filled with the Spirit, just as Jesus was, but we cringe to see where that path leads. We cringe that, you know, there's no glory or power or wealth or ease, but in fact, it's humility. It's self-denial. It's to the wilderness where we battle with our willful flesh. That's where the Spirit leads us. But we can have confidence that through the power uh, of this same Spirit and armed with the same Scriptures, we stand with Jesus in the wilderness and we take on Satan's best shot. And we rely on God's strength. This is the, the hard-fought way of faith. And it's the way that Jesus chose. There's just there's no other way for us. I also want you to know that like Jesus, uh, just like with Jesus, Satan keeps his eyes open for an opportune time to tempt us in our lives. In those weak moments when we're distracted or overly tired or just hungry, can we stand with Jesus? Our temptations are actually a sign of strength. Right? It means that we're on the devil's radar, that we are we're causing havoc to the powers of this world. And as we grow spiritually, temptation will actually intensify and we'll be called on to depend even more on the Spirit and surrender even more to God's plan and be even more in need of prayer. But we remember Jesus' words. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Can you underline that word? today in your Bibles. Jesus is speaking about a very important moment in history. Today means now. He's not talking about tomorrow. He's not talking about some time in the past. Today, the Messiah has come. Today is the day of salvation. Today, our King reigns. And the today that Jesus proclaims is a day that will never end. 
I want to encourage you to join Jesus in that today, that never-ending day that He has established, where His kingdom is, becomes a part of our lives. His kingdom becomes our destiny. Uh, we can do that. We can put our trust in Jesus. We can ask Him to save us. We can ask Him to be our King and our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. All we have to do is put our trust in Him. So I want to encourage you to do that today. Not tomorrow, and not sometime in the future. Not sometime in the past, but today. Amen. Well, just as Jesus was faithful to His Father, uh, we desire to be faithful as well. We desire to be faithful with our, our thought life, with our actions, and also with our finances, with our money. And so we want to make sure to, um, to keep our offering our gifts to God in this way. Uh, you can do that on our website. You can bring in uh, you know, uh, envelopes into the office at church. But we want to support God's ministry with our finances as, as faithful, spirit-filled followers of Jesus. So we encourage you to do that this week. Um, we also have a couple announcements of next, next Wednesday. We have our normal uh, dinner time at 5.30 with activities to follow for youth and kids and parents uh, are invited to Echo. And next week, David, Pastor David will be back to preach on the second half of Luke chapter 4, where we see Jesus doing his ministry in Capernaum. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, our memory verse is Luke 4.21. 421. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. We remember that today we are called into God's kingdom. And so I want to leave you with this blessing. May you go in the peace of God, knowing that he has invited you into his kingdom. He's made you his child. May you live in the everlasting today of Jesus. Amen.